going forward with our program, but that's quite all right as well. So, uh, again, I thank you all for coming, and Jim, you want to yeah. take it from here? Yeah, sure. We're going to jump in. Josh, you're going to start out? All right. You want to do your own introduction? I'm going to ask that we mic up, though, because uh, people in the back want to make sure they can hear, so if you could. Can you guys hear me back there? No, no. Come on, professionals. Where are microphones? I talk about it. Thank you. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So my name is Josh Brown. I'm with Berkshire. I'm a broker with Berkshire Hathaway Start Real Estate in Woodstock. And I'm here to talk to you about 10 reasons why buy real estate. So how many of you currently have investment property? How many of you would like to have investment property? How many of you would like to sell your investment property? Good. It's, good. it's good to be thinking of all those things tonight. We're going to cover a little bit about some of those things. So, these are my 10 reasons why to invest in real estate. They're just from my personal experience. So, appreciation. Uh, in our local current markets, I see some appreciation on Class A and B properties, turnkey properties. So, there's some opportunity there for some rental properties that I see developing. Rents are nice and high right now. They've been sustained for the last six to nine months, and I think they will, uh, I believe that they will continue to stay there for the next year or so. Passive income. So what I like about passive income is I can take an asset, such as a two flat or a four flat, I can buy that, and I can have income coming in every month, positive. You know, I try to shoot for two to $300 a door netting, and um, so when we sell real estate, we have to keep going out there and finding more clients to do more business. Whereas with the passive income, we get a check every month. How many people like that? Yes. I like that. And so there's definitely opportunity there to grow our passive income. And with that, leveraging. How can we leverage in today's market? We have low interest rates. We have um, lines of credit. We have equity in our buildings that we can take and leverage into the properties. And we can borrow against them. We can get some capital out of them to expand our leverage and how we do that. And so real estate is really unique, I think. I have never been able to go to a bank and say, I would like to purchase $800,000 in gold I only have $200,000. Will you guys give me a loan? doesn't work that way with stocks, mutual funds, gold. But in real estate, we can do that. We can put $200,000 down, and we can buy an $800,000 to $900,000 piece of property, depending on the LTV with our lenders. Return on investment. Return on investment currently, and why I'm seeing in multi-units and some single families is double-digit returns. You guys seen some of that with some of your investment properties? 10% ROIs, 12%, 8% cap rates. So I see some of that out there depending on where it's at, and we can definitely get good returns on our money out there. Um, single family, I think, with rental property, it's pretty good. I'm seeing between 8 and 10% multi-units, 4 to 10 units. It's a little less per square foot to uh, buy and rehab. So we might be able to see a little bit more. I've seen stuff as high as 15% there. So we definitely are getting good ROIs on our money. And what ROI is just return on investment. So for example, if I take, uh, I have a $100,000 piece of property I want to buy, and I put, it's a two flat, I put a tenant in there, I'm getting $1,000 a month out of each unit. That's $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year. So I'm getting a 24% R or minus expenses, I'd be getting a 24% ROI, which is a little high. But we have property taxes we have to take off, we have insurance we have to take off, and there's some management expenses and uh, some uh, capital improvements. So if you take those expenses off, and we'd be probably looking more like a 15% ROI. So, um, principal pay down. How is that an advantage and a reason to invest? Principal pay down. So we have our mortgage whatever that might be. We have our down payment. We'll use a $100,000 purchase price as an easy example. We put 20% down on it, and that loan can be amortized 
over five years, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. So the sooner we pay that off, we're paying down our principal, we have less debt, less of the money from the investment property that has to go to service the debt. Does that make sense? So if we can pay down our principal, we're getting more capital, more equity put in our building, we're saving more money from paying interest on that loan, and we can use that money there to leverage on another property if we want. Tax benefits. There are definitely some tax benefits that I've seen over the years in real estate. We have depreciation, it's a wonderful thing. We have deductions, whether it's capital improvements, whether it is uh, putting new appliances in, whether it's maintenance, whether it's land improvements, all that's deductible. Check with your account, but I've always found that to be deductible. Hedging against inflation. This has been something that I've always liked about it. How do we hedge against inflation? Um, my analysis believe inflation is coming, if not already here. Owning real estate and using leverage, especially with low interest rates, is a great way to hedge yourself against inflation. If prices rise, so will the cost of housing. Owning assets that rise with uh, owning assets is a great way to protect your wealth against inflation. So, increasing rents. I personally see rents being at the cap right now. I don't see rents increasing. Not that I'm an expert on that, but I think they're up there pretty good. And we've been able to maintain those the last 12 to 18 months. Um, so that's good. So how does that help us with investment property? We have interest rates that are low and rents high, that makes our spread better. And what I mean by our spread is if we have a mortgage on the property, what the difference is between that and what our income is, minus deductions or minus our expenses, that's our spread. And so we can increase that a little bit and decrease that a little bit depending on what the rents are. So that definitely helps with that. Retirement income. How many people here are looking for to have real estate holdings for retirement income? Okay, a few of us, that's good. So why is that? Why do I think it's good for retirement income? I would think, because I age, and I'm guessing everybody else does, I want some assets working for me so I don't have to keep selling. Granted, I love selling, and it's great, and it's enjoyable, but you know, it's nice to know that we have some income coming in there because I know some pension plans that are falling apart. Some people have lost some money in some 401ks, 403bs, you know, some of that's recovered a little bit, but definitely having it in real estate. A lot of wealthy business owners and people hold retirement income in real estate. Why? They own it. They can leverage against it. They can pay it off from the bank and it can be cleared. They can do all different kinds of things and the tax benefits are great. Creative exits. Um, Whenever I do a deal, whether it's brokeraging a deal, I buy an investment deal, or I'm doing a creative deal, I always begin with the end in mind. What do I want to do with this deal? What can I do with this deal? If I've owned a deal for five years, if I own it for five years, rehab it and sell it. If I plan on holding this for 20 years, or 27 years, getting all the depreciation out of it. Um, always have an exit strategy, I believe, is the best way. So if I'm doing a rehab, I'm looking at some numbers. I want to know what this property is going to sell for before I get into it. What's the ARV, the after repair value? I want to know what all those numbers are, and I work backwards to see what my building costs are going to be, my closing costs, my acquisition costs, and uh, listing it with us to see where that is. So I know what price I can pay for a property. So that's a good extra strategy. If I have a two flat or a four flat, you know, do I want to hold these for five years or ten years? If I got some good appreciation, some good cash flow, maybe there's someone that I can sell this to or I want to sell it and move up to an eight flat. So if we have some appreciation there, we can do a 1031 exchange with some tax-free dollars and have a nice down payment for that flat. So always begin with these ten benefits here. I find that they work very good for me. I think they'll work very good for anyone. They're just general ideas some things that will work for me. Um, if you have any questions, write them down, and I'll be glad to answer them at the end of the session. Thank you. All right, let's take the microphone in front of you.
right, switching to the next speaker here. We've got five or six different presenters for you with different topics, different parts of investment. So I am Jim Heisler. I'm the CEO here at the Heartland Realtor Organization. Uh, so we provide products and services to about a thousand real estate agents here in McHenry County and beyond, and another couple thousand beyond that with some uh, partnerships we run. But beyond my being a CEO, my wife and I own investment property. We've been owning investment property, it's fun to say, since the last century. All right, so about 16 years. Um, so we have about eight properties, so we've been doing this a long time. We've dealt, come across a lot of different uh, obstacles and fun things, but we've enjoyed it. We haven't had too many difficult times until recently. Um, but that's just one out of, again, a few properties that we've had for many years. So I'm going to hit, ah, thank you. My uh, president is telling us to remind you about the recording. We are being recorded, we up here being recorded, uh, and of course, audio will be recorded. So when you walk to the room, you agree to being recorded. We're not going to take pictures of you, that's not the plan. But if you ask a question, you may be recorded audibly. So uh, if you speak, we may hear you on recording. You've given us permission by coming here and, and seeing the signs. So thank you, Casey. All right, I've got like five points I want to run through. They gave me the numbers. One of my favorite things, I love spreadsheets. So I'm going to touch on a few things here, and then I've got a couple more slides. Collecting rents, just briefly, there's lots of different ways you can collect rent. You know, the typical way, of course, is to get the money directly from the tenant. Um, I've got one tenant that I go to their mailbox, I pick up a check from them. They leave it in their mailbox, I drive by and get the check. I've got other tenants that take it to the bank for me and drop it in the bank. I give them the deposit slips, I put it in. They, they take it to the bank and drop it off. Now, I have a separate savings account, savings account set up at that bank, and it's the only account I have at that bank just to help protect myself. I don't want to keep other assets in the bank and then some tenant decides they're upset with me and then they start fraud and they steal my money and then we have to go chase it down. I'd rather, if there's a problem, they take it off from that one bank account and it's gone. Uh, we don't leave money in there. Money, all of our rents go into that one account and then we move it out monthly to our other account, to our checking accounts, we write our checks from there. So just things to think about. Things go bad and before they go bad, you want to have prepared for what happens if they go bad so you have a plan for it. So just a couple ideas in collecting rents. Uh, I've thought about actually putting a little lock box up on one of the properties, but then again, I don't want my other tenants to know what homes I own, so I'm not going that route, but that could be something. I could put a mailbox type of thing in the yard of one of the properties and have everybody drop it off there. That's an option. Um, so think about how you're gonna get those rents collected and how those payments will be made. Section eight, a lot of people think of section eight, that's the housing assistance. They think of that as being a bad thing. I love Section 8. As a landlord, I love it. It does two things for me that others I wouldn't get otherwise. It guarantees me rent from the government. Now typically, when the government, when the housing authority is qualifying these tenants, they're going to look at their income and decide how much of the rent the government's going to pay and how much the tenant's going to pay. I had one situation where it was $1,000 monthly rent, the tenant paid $10. I wasn't terribly pleased with that because they don't have skin in the game. If they walk away, what do they care? So they were a good tenant. It worked out, but that, that made me a little nervous. With Section 8, you're still qualifying tenants the same way you will otherwise. I'm going to let um, Domenica is going to cover that for you. But you're still going to qualify tenants even in Section 8. You don't have to take them just because they're on Section 8. You can still qualify them through the other ways that she's going to talk about. But Section 8 is great because, one, you're going to get at least a portion of the rent, and I'll usually say a large portion of the rent, paid to you, directly to you, it's from the government, it's good, it's good as government is. Uh, I've never had a problem with that. The second thing is, I think it puts those tenants on notice that they have to behave. They have to be good tenants or they could lose their qualifications and no longer be in the program. They're getting a large chunk of their monthly housing payment paid for by the government. If they misbehave and they lose that, where are they going to live? And that's a fact that they understand. So I like Section 8, I don't have issues with it. Um, there are people that think that these are lesser quality people, they're not. I've only got one right now of our eight properties at Section 8. Uh, she's great, she's phenomenal. I love her, I love her family, they're great people. Um, single mom, three kids, it, it works out really well. So just don't think of Section 8 as being bad, it's not, I personally like it, but uh, that's my opinion. Bi-monthly payments, I also have some tenants that are on bi-monthly. They can't afford the full payment a month they get paid twice a month or they get paid every other Friday. So I accept rents from two of them, three of them, as they can pay it. So they pay half of it every other, you know, the 15th and 30th. Uh, think about that. It's a creative way. For me, it makes me feel good. I know I'm getting at least half of it and it gives me a two-week notice of, hey, there's a problem here. If they miss a payment, I'm only at half of the month's rent before it's a full month and a full 
amount that's in jeopardy. So think about that, it could be creative. You have to keep your books though, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Capitalization rate, I don't know if anybody has heard of the cap rate. A lot of investors, serious investors, look at the cap rate. The cap's rate important to them. I don't care about the cap rate. Here's the cap rate, here's what it is. It's basically, I'm not gonna go through the slide, we're not gonna figure cap rates, so I don't have time for it, but uh, time here in the room. But what it says at the bottom is it's net operating income divided by the sales price. The problem I have with cap rate is I finance all my properties. The bank is a, is a part owner with me. So when you finance it, it throws this number out the window in my opinion. So I use a different form, um, actually it's ahead. Payment tracking, I mentioned that. Here's a quick brief uh, snapshot of payment tracking. You've got, in your packet, you've got a copy of this, but you don't have the same one you see on the screen. What I want to point to down here is I have one set up for each one of my properties. I obviously I took my numbers off, these are make-believe numbers up here. But I've got on this on mine at home, I've got the property names all listed, all eight of my properties are listed on the bottom of the sheet. I've got one payment chart, I've got people that pay me that the, the monthly their their term of their lease is the fifteenth to the fourteenth, no, sixteenth to the fifteenth of each month, and I've got others that are calendar months. So it goes back and forth. I like it that I've got alternative incomes, but it's a nightmare trying to think of who owes me money. So I keep track. Trust me, I know who owes me money. But <laughs> I keep track of it, I keep the spreadsheet, and I will tell you that if you ever have an issue with a tenant paying you, having this information is critical that you're gonna to need to be able to prove when you got money, showing it, detailing it. I also, with tenants that I know are running a little bit late or I'm suspicious that there's gonna be problems, I send them statements. Even a tenant I have right now who's everything's going great, they pay me in every half month. They're actually paying in arrears, so they're actually in the property before they make the payment. I make sure I send them one of these monthly so they see Here's where you're at, but you're really behind. I don't tell them that, but it's there. If I ever have an issue, I ever have to go to court, let's hope not, I've got some documentation to show that I've been telling them all along where they're at and what's going on. So real quick here, date, uh, I put the security deposit in, the amount, amount received, amount due. I, over here I have their ad, the property address, tenant name, security deposit, and then lease term. It's just a quick snapshot for me. When I need to know, when is that lease up again? I have other ways I do that too, which we're not gonna go into now. But it's a good format for me to be able to tell how much money they owe. Keep track of the payments. Uh, track your mileage is another thing. We're not gonna cover this really, but make sure you track your mileage. If you're driving to and from the properties, if you're looking for properties, track that mileage and write it down. I've got over a thousand miles driven last year to and from properties. That adds up when you're filing your taxes. So keep a good track, keep running a record. And you see already, this year alone, this is fairly close. I modified it, but I think I'm at 225 miles this year already driving around the county to different properties and different reasons. So keep track of that. Your accountant may want to use that at tax time. All right, back to my form. Does the deal make sense? I don't use cap rate. It's actually on my form. I made this form up. You've got a copy in there. I have this in Excel. It runs through. It's automatic. Uh, cap rates at the bottom. But my more important number is what I see right above it. I want to know how quickly am I going to get repaid? How many months does it take? for me to get my cash back. So I've invested, if, if this was a deal, I've invested $21,000 into the deal. They were asking $90,000, I paid eighty. dollars I, I put 20% down, so that was $16,000. Closing cost of $1,800, the seller assistance, which is really um, tax credits. When you sell the property, they have to pay for taxes, so sometimes you get a little bit of a tax credit at closing. So how much is that? You get a little bit of money back, so $1,000 came back to us at closing and offset the closing costs and then improvements to the property. Uh, most of our properties, we're putting 3,000 in regardless. We're going in, we're making sure they're in good condition. My wife and I, we have a philosophy that if we wouldn't live in the property, we're not gonna try to rent it. Um, so if it's not in good enough condition for us, that's our, our check, our filter. Um, so then I add in here the mortgage payment, rent rates, insurance in the property, taxes in the property, tax escrow. I love having the taxes escrow. Some people wanna keep it themselves. With eight properties, it is a lot of money. I still prefer, it. the bank just take it, the bank just pay it. I don't have to make sure I have the money. That's a personal preference. But it's a lot of money. I could put it in the account. I could be earning interest at 0.1%. You know, I'm gonna make a $3. I can buy McDonald's at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, personal preference there. Adding in my total debt, 783. This property, I just do this for myself. It's a four bedroom, one bath. I just keep that in my head. Uh, you know, right there is my little shortcut. $1,200 monthly rent, so that property nets $417. Annually, that's about five grand. 
So I take five grand into that 2180, it's gonna take me 52 months to repay my cash into the deal. That's what's important to me. How quick do I get repaid? Again, if you wanna look at cap rates, that's a great way to, to uh, it's a good tre uh, trend mark to evaluate properties against other properties. I use this number, how quick am I getting repaid? I don't wanna, personally, I look at 60 months as being, that's a little too far out for me. There are other deals currently available that are in the 50s. Um, and these probably are real numbers from properties that are available today here in the county that are pretty close by. All right, I know it's fast, I just used my drive through voice, but I only have 10 minutes. So, I'm available afterwards for questions. If you have questions in between, of course, you may certainly ask them, but um, Casey mentioned that you've got this sheet of paper right down, or Josh did, right down in there. If you have questions, we'll certainly answer those at the end. And Dominica, I think you're next, right? So she's going to talk about qualifying tenants. Sort of. Put that in your pocket. Put this on. You're good. You good? Mm -hmm. So official. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, my name is Dominica and I'm with Keller Williams Success Realty in Barrington. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about tenants in general. There's going to be a little bit more than qualifying. And I'm not going to tell you horror stories, but I am going to tell you some truths. I have been on the end of working with tenants, helping them to find properties, and I've also represented landlords. So I have a little experience on both sides of that, as well as I have been a landlord for 29 years, so there are some hopes, but anyway, <laughs> there's some good things too. The first thing is, let's see if I know how to do this here, tenants. Uh, where do you find them? What are the advantages and the disadvantages of the places where you find them? Do we have any landlords here? I know that question was asked. Are there any landlords that aren't real estate agents? Okay, so if you're going to list your place, where would you start? What's the first place you would do to try to find a tenant? Neighborhood people. Okay. Word of mouth, family members. Perfect. Anyone else? My realtor. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> okay. My realtor. Okay. Well, the number one answer that I've heard so far before today was Craigslist. A lot of people would put things on Craigslist. The advantage of Craigslist is it's free. The disadvantage of Craigslist is the scams. And there are scams. And one of the scams that has, has gone on and actually happened is the fact that people take your photos that you've put in there, the same exact address, they take it and they put it in something else. They put their email address on there and there are some very naive souls out there that will send them their money before they get a key. And then these people show up at a house and they think they're gonna move in on that day. They've left everything, they have their truck and you're the landlord and there's somebody about to move in your house and you have nothing, you have no idea what it is. So that is a disadvantage. The other disadvantage of Craigslist or the newspaper is how many times have you shown up there and the tenant just doesn't show. So you've wasted your time and your money by standing there and waiting for somebody to come and you know no history on this person and if you're going to show the place by yourself, you know nothing about them. So you do have to do a little bit of homework and just make sure you're not showing it alone if you're going to do this without a broker. Have somebody with you. Bring your husband or your wife or someone else so you're just not showing a vacant place to somebody you've never met before. Okay, well, the newspaper. Somebody said newspaper. Uh, I don't really, I interviewed, not interviewed, asked questions to about 15 people last week about what they would do. and. I did ask some young people and I asked my daughters and they wouldn't even know where to find a newspaper. So if you do have the younger generation, a lot of them, I mean how many in here have a smartphone? Probably every one of you. So if you can't go to your phone and look up an app on how to find, real, uh, how to find an apartment, you're probably not going to you know, look in the newspaper. So it does still work. The advantage of a newspaper is it's local and it's cost effective. The disadvantage again is not everybody reads the newspaper, and again, you don't know the person, which brings me to a realtor, which is my favorite. Okay, the realtor, the advantage is right away, first thing is 35,000 realtors are in the MLS, rough, give or take a few. So if you are going to list a property, 
anybody that is working with an agent that is looking for a place, and why wouldn't they work for an agent, or have an agent work for them, because it's free to the tenant. So you remember um, the yellow page ad, you know, let your fingers do the? Okay, thank you. I was wondering if nobody said the answer that what I was going to do. But anyway, the, the tenant thinks the same thing. Let your realtor do the work. Let your realtor do the walking. So they do all of the homework for you. They've already qualified, not qualified the tenants, but semi. We're going to get to that in a minute. And there's 35,000 of them. So anybody looking is going to just automatically get your listing for your rental right into their email. Credit and background checks. Well, I have I have to cheat a little bit here and just take a little um, note. I you know when you go into the if you has anybody been a tenant or has anybody looked through the MLS? Have you ever rented here where you did use a broker? Anyone? Okay. Well, when you do look it up and the agents in the room will know that they when they list a rental they put in there that you, a credit you were going to have to do a background check and. Some, everybody does it a little bit different. Some agents, some brokerages, won't even let you as the agent bring the credit check. They want to do it themselves. So you as the landlord, are you get to pick how specific you want to be. So on your handout, there's going to be a couple of places that you can do on your own if you don't use a broker, or you can do the credit and background check. You can do it nationally. You can do it just if you want to just do it statewide, you can do that. But you don't have to always do the background. You can sometimes just do the credit report. Uh, the other advantage of a realtor, and we're going to get a little bit more on credit in a little bit. The other advantage of a realtor is the history. I have here reputation of the agent. After I submitted this to Jim, I changed things around a little bit. So the history is really important. When I first started, I worked for another with another agent, and she taught me a lot about you know you get a when you start with real estate you get what everybody else doesn't want. So I did a lot of rentals and I loved it, but I did not want to waste my time or my landlord's time. So you are trying to rent a place and you want to get it rented in a month, you need to have somebody that's going to not waste your time by bringing tenants that are never going to qualify. So before I even bring someone into your home, I have met them either in person or on the phone, and I have asked them to give me four different things. One of them is their application already filled out. I want it filled out, how many are gonna live in the home, I want it so I have it in my file. I also want pay stubs for the last four weeks of their work, so I know they really are working and not just telling me that they're working. I also want a hardship letter. So if they have had a bankruptcy or a short sale or something like that, I need some kind of a couple of paragraphs just explaining to my landlord why their credit is going to be bad. So we have no surprises. So when we pull that report and they see it, the landlord already has an idea of what's happened in their, their situation to get them to this and what they've done to improve that situation. An application for the credit to be pulled and one of the favorites that I liked to get was a letter of recommendation from their current landlord. So then I have all of this already in a file so that if we walk into the place and somebody likes it, I just have to push a button and it is already to the landlord. And everything's in one spot. Agents really like this too, so they're not getting piecemealed all through the, you know, all different emails with different things on there. So those are some of the advantages of having an agent broker work for you. And the application process is going to be um, addressed, I believe, after. I'm finished. This is also very, very important. Work history, if you're doing this on your own, even if you have an agent, when the credit report comes back in the background check, your agent, he or she, cannot pick your tenant for you. You still have to do the homework as far as doing your due diligence and calling these people and really making sure that, you, that they are working and check the work history. Rental history. There is, you can check McHenry County, the clerk of the city court. There's, um, I think the website is on the paper. Is it on there, Jim? I don't think it is. Okay. So you can do that. And also, it is really important. You know, I can't, the rental history and work, I can't even stress enough to verify, verify, and verify how important that actually is to do. The common questions that I get from landlords and red flags.
If somebody has many different jobs in a very short period of time, that would be a red flag. Okay, and then you want to look for a sense of stability. If the price, uh, if the um, price of the credit report, a lot of people say, well, the price, you know, it's it's a hundred dollars a couple or whatever it is. That's that my clients aren't going to want to have to do that every time they look for a place. If the price of the credit report is going to scare them away, and your rent is fifteen hundred dollars a month. Do you really want that to be your tenant? If they're really not gonna take your place because of the price of a credit report, usually that means that there's something else that they're trying to hide that they don't want you to see. Another thing that I don't have on here is excuses about their previous landlord. I, um, I don't, she's not here, but there was somebody that was gonna be coming and, you know, she is a client of mine and there were some red flags and I cannot talk somebody out of it. If somebody wants to take somebody because their place has been vacant a little too long and they're afraid of losing that month's rent, in the long run, you can really lose a lot more money than a month's rent if you don't do your homework and you don't really follow through and really check things out and listen to what they're saying. Really listen. If somebody is saying to you, you know, I didn't get my security deposit back because my landlord, you know, just flipped out or he promised me this or I gave him 6000 on front and he decided to keep it all. If your landlord's here, I mean, think about it. If you had a tenant that paid you every single month on time and left your property in a nice condition with just normal wear and tear, wear and tear would you not give them a great recommendation? Why would you not? If a landlord doesn't want to talk to you, Obviously, there was something wrong. So be aware of those excuses from the landlord. Okay, another thing, another red flag that I would say is if somebody comes in with three or four roommates, just, you cannot discriminate, so I'm not telling you to discriminate. I'm just saying make sure one of them makes enough money to be able to pay because you, you have to talk, I'm sure that, I'm hoping that the um, person after me that's going to come up and talk about the legal ramifications of things, you, there's got to be a way where one person on there can be responsible for that lease. You want to be able to find out if the other three roommates bail, who's going to pay for the rent. And then the other thing you want to look for is when you are getting a recommendation from the previous landlord that it's not their mother. <laughs> How do you know that? Well, you don't really know that, but you can kind of tell by certain questions that you can ask. Okay, um, on here, what can be overlooked? I'm going to go over that in a minute here. I just want to see if there is, there's two other things that when you work with a broker that they can get for you. I don't have this as a handout, but there is a property condition report. You could probably make your own, and there's tenant responsibilities. I really recommend that you have those two things because you will walk through with your tenant before they move in and look at the condition of the property, take photos, make sure you do that so that when they leave, that it's not your word against theirs of the big hole in the wall that they say was there or the carpeting that's got battery acid all over the floor. No, I'm really not trying to scare you. They're not all like that. I'm just trying to have you be cautious is all and just to be able to back yourself up a little bit. What can be overlooked on a credit report? Read the report and look at why their credit is bad. What caused it? Were they at a job for a long period of time and then there was a downsize? Was there a medical issue that caused them to not be able to go to work for a while, which caused them to lose their job and there's more bills or there's just a lot of medical bills? Is the credit cards late and that can really mess up your, you know, your credit report? Did they pay their rent on time is what you wanna know. I don't really care if they miss their car payment. I don't care if they don't pay their credit cards on time. But if their history shows that they pay their rent month after month after month, I'm okay with that. Am I saying that you should do that too? I'm just saying be, be careful and really look through the credit report so that you can see why it got to the point that it is. Credit, courts, uh, credit scores used to be, uh, I think, what was the highest score that you've ever seen? One of the agents in here, anybody? 750, 800, 8, eight. Well, last year, you know, 600 was considered 800. <laughs> that was like the high credit score. So lastly, but definitely not least, many people have said that they just trust their gut. I've met them, I've talked to them. Susie and Joe are so sweet, this is their first time. They told me how wonderful things are. 
trust your gut, you'll end up in a rut. I, I know that I'm the one who's done it. I've done it over and over. My husband's here in the room. I'm the one who has said it. I don't know if you can actually say to somebody, there's certain questions you can't ask, like, are you clean? Um, you know, but you, well, you can ask it. I don't know if they're going to tell you the truth. So what I have done, and, and I, my husband will attest to this, is I, I just say, I'd like to come and fill out the application at your house. And I don't say I have to come now. 24 hours is sufficient notice. And in, in 24 hours, if they can make the place look decent enough for you to be able to sit in there, then I'm fine with it. I don't think they have to, I don't have to lick their kitchen floor. But if they can make it look presentable enough in 24 hours, but if you go to their place and there's rats running around and you have food hanging off the floorboards, you know, you, you, might, you might reconsider. But you can't say that. I, I know there's things that you can and cannot say. So be careful. <coughs> Definitely do the checking out. Do your diligence and follow through, and your chances are much higher of having a reliable tenant. Thanks. Thank you. This is what you really have to worry about. <laughs> My name is Doreen Pollock. I am an attorney. I have a Woods, uh, Woodstock we can't, office. Excuse me, Doreen. We can't hardly hear you. Okay, then I will move this. Thank you. Is that better? Much better. Okay, we'll start again. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Doreen Pollock. I am an attorney. I have an office in Woodstock. And I've been practicing here in McHenry County for 23 years. And I'm here to tell you about the legal concerns with respect to tenants, and specifically I've been invited to address uh, three general areas. Uh, the first of which being discrimination, the second of which being when do you call your attorney, and then finally the eviction process. So let's start with discrimination. It is illegal for you as a landlord to treat uh, tenants or prospective tenants differently based upon certain traits or characteristics. In other words, the protected classes. What are those protected classes and who defines them? Well, generally, they're going to be defined by either our federal government under the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act, or in Illinois, it's also going to be defined according to the Human Rights Act. The federal government prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability or familiar status. And most of those um, are pretty much clear as far as what the definition is. The only one I wanted to uh, expand upon is in regard to familial status. What does that mean? Do they have children? Do they have custodial rights to children who will also be living at the property or are they pregnant? You cannot tell someone you are not allowed to live here if you have children. So that is what I consider in that regard. Illinois law also uh, protects against those classes but expands upon them. And specifically, they expand in regard to ancestry. So it's not just your uh, national origin, but also what were your ancestors be, uh, before you? What is your age? What is your marital status? What is your military status? Um, they cannot discriminate against you if you've been uh, dishonorably discharged from the military. Uh, what is your order of protection status? Meaning, do you have an order of protection against you? Or do you have an order of protection in your favor? You cannot tell someone they cannot live in your rental property based upon those. And then finally, sexual orientation. I do have an asterisk by age and also had one by familiar, familial status in the last one. And that's because there are certain exceptions to these general rules. Uh, one exception that is most common is if there is a housing 
uh, development where it's considered senior housing, you can in fact restrict according to age, and you can in fact tell the people in the senior housing areas that you cannot have children. So those would be the exceptions. Now, uh, what are some examples of what constitutes discrimination? Uh, as Dominica tell you, you know, if you trust your gut, you end up in a rut. There are just going to be certain people that rub you wrong. Well, you're absolutely within your rights to tell that person, no, I do not have to rent to you. But if the basis of that gut feeling is one of those protected classes, and it can be proven that that was the basis of that gut feeling, then you are in violation of these laws. So for example, if you refuse to rent to someone because uh, there is an ethnic accent when they're calling on the phone. If you make it more difficult for someone to obtain an apartment or rental property based upon the fact that you do not like their religious beliefs. Um, if you mislead a prospective tenant into believing whether or not uh, there is something available, that also constitutes discrimination. If you charge more rent to someone who falls within one of those protected classes, that is discrimination. Sexual harassment, do I have to say it? That's discrimination. Um, you can also not discriminate by what amenities are available to a tenant. You can't tell someone, well, everyone else has access to the pool except for you, or you're not allowed to use those laundry facilities. That is discrimination. And you also cannot threaten to evict someone based upon the fact that they threaten you with a fair housing complaint. So having gone through that and based on the understanding that we all plan not to discriminate, what is the process that a tenant or prospective tenant would follow if they believe that in fact they were being discriminated against? Well, basically.